And Second Thessalonians verses or chapter one verses eleven through twelve be our text, as Sister Logan just read. That God would count you worthy of this calling. Now, firstly, I want to proclaim to you this morning, brethren, that God has made us worthy in salvation. Uh, this is not a question. Uh, we know fundamentally on a foundational level in our in our fallen Ad Adamic state, there was nothing that we could do to merit this salvation. There's nothing that we could do to make ourselves worthy of being called unto this high calling that we've been called to in Christ Jesus. But this morning I want to declare to you that God has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has done this in our salvation. But uh, our, our brother T Paul, he, he, we can see how sensitive he is in, in praying this for them to, to the will of God. That he, he prays that God would count them worthy of this calling that they have been called to. That he, he would count them uh, worthy in the continuance of this. Um, and, and Second Peter, this is in the sense that he's saying this, he says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power that hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that has called us unto glory and virtue. See, He's made us worthy. He's given us all things that we need in, in Christ Jesus to be able to walk worthy of the calling that He has called us to. Uh, he's called us to this calling in Christ Jesus, and He is... Uh, he has underwritten that calling. He has given us the power that we need to walk worthy of the calling that we've been called to. We don't have to be in the category of those who are unworthy. Amen. See, not only have we been made partakers of the divine nature in salvation, not only have we been transformed by the renewing of our mind and been changed in our essential person to one who's acceptable before God, we've been made meet to be partakers of this inheritance and that we've been given all of the blessings and all of the resources and these heavenly places in Christ Jesus that we need to walk in the newness of life. We've been given the, 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 the legs, so to speak, and we've been given the energy that we need to walk in it. To walk as, walk as those who've been given the Spirit of God within us to guide us into all truth. And this is a, this worthiness is the, the the direction that we are moving in. This is that we might glorify Him. This is going to be the the culmination of what the apostles talking about here. This is the whole the whole purpose for which this thing is being worked out. Now, well, we don't have to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps, so to speak, and, uh, and, and walk in this life by our own power. This is not something that we have to do. But yet, at the same time, this is a work that we have to participate in. It, it, it's a work that God does, but it's something that He does in you. See, we're made workers together with God in salvation. See, by the empowerment of His Spirit and the fellowship of Christ, and we have this access to the throne of grace, to, to, to things and help in time of need. He's, he's called us into this calling. He's put us in the way in which we are to walk. And He's empowered us to do so. Now, now the question that the Apostle is really asking in here, here the... the, the uh, the thing that he is asking for these brethren in this prayer is um, strength to endure, to be, to be able to endure to the end without compromising the purpose for which they've been called into this service. Uh, he's called you for a reason. In the, in the ages to come, are you going to be equal to the task of uh, bearing the glory of Almighty God? This is going to be a, a heavy, weighty task. That the, the, the church in its aggregate form is going to be a, a, a mere, a perfect image of Christ. Uh, these have to be those who are worthy to be able to bear this image. So the question is, in the present time, will you fold under the adversity now? That, that, will you be able to face the opposition that stands in the way to that end? See, so you, you are to be the, berry, the bearer of the glory of God in the church as the bride of Christ for all eternity. It's, it, this is a responsibility that requires an unyielding and unquestionable devotion. Uh, there's, there's no imperfect gems in the king's crown, so to speak. 
Uh, this is something that's that's mirrored in uh, in the physical. And God, obviously, God has made it this way. He's created the earth to, for us to be able to see these pictures. And that, that gems are made under an extraordinary amount of pressure and heat. That these things are are made in the earth when this this pressure is formed against them, and and that's how that's how the actual composition of the gem is made up. And, and in fact, when the gem is taken out of the ground, there's still some work that has to be done. It's a gem in its composition. It's a gem, but it, it still has to be polished. It has to be faceted so that it, it'll be worthy to be called what it is, a gem. And uh, two examples of this, in, in Revelation uh, chapter 3 and the uh, fourth verse, he says, Thou hast a few names in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. See, that they've been given these garments, they've been set in the way that they are to walk, and, and they haven't defiled their garments. They, they uh, use the resources that they were given in salvation, they relied on the Lord to empower them to walk in this salvation. They are worthy. And Ephesians 4, um, verse 1, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the, ver of the vocation wherewith you were called. This is just something that we must exhort, exhort each other on a regular basis and not lose sight of this, that this is a high calling. Amen. This is the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Uh, in 2 Peter 2.9, he said it this way, but you are a chosen generation. You're, you're a royal priesthood. You've actually been made kings and priests unto God. It may not seem that way in the present time, but we, we can reason on this. Uh, we're kings. We've been set in a royal lineage, so to speak. Uh, he, he's, he's made us a peculiar people that we should show forth the praises of Him who's called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. So then, that God, he's praying for them that God would count them worthy of this calling and that He would fulfill all of the good pleasure of His goodness. Now, Sister Nicole spoke some of this earlier when uh, the Lord communicated the Father's uh, desire to, to give them the kingdom. That God has gone to extensive lengths to uh, reveal this aspect of His nature to mankind, that God is a good God. Uh, although it is very true that God is, a, is a, the judge of all the earth, and He is holy and terrible, and that He is a consuming fire, and He's angry at the wicked every day, this is true. But it's also true that, true that He is a good, He is a good God. And it is, it is His desire to share of this goodness with mankind. This is, this is what's behind. This is what's driving this salvation. It's, he's really not looking to damn you on a technicality. You know, the, the flesh can get you to think this way if, 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 if you see God the wrong way. This is the way that the servant who buried his talents, this is the way that he thought. You know, He thought that God was, that the, the, the master was requiring more of the servant than he could ever possibly do. You know, He thought that he was a, a hard taskmaster and so he buried his talent. And this isn't the way the Lord is. He's not looking for an opportunity to condemn you. He, the, the opportunity is there. If that's what he wanted to do, he could do it right now. Rather, he's looking for an opportunity to bless. He's looking for an opportunity to be merciful. Yeah. Amen. Now, this has always been true of God. This is God's nature. This is who he is. Uh, it just hasn't been able to be seen the way it is now under the new covenant. And this is actually something that he has communicated to, to men, even in times past. Those who were sensitive to him, he was able to articulate this to him. Um, this is the whole of the redemption of the mankind. It's like him providing a means by which his grace and his kindness and his mercy might be able to made man, made manifest. Now... Uh, in Exodus 34, we know that he, he declared this truth unto Moses when he was on the mount. And I noticed this too, that the Lord declared this before he, he talked about the things that, that, that were... Um, before he talked about visiting the iniquity on the fathers, upon the children, and upon the children's children. He was actually able to tell this to Moses because he was sensitive. He, he preferred to say this before the other thing. The Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy 
mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And this is before any of this had ever even happened. He's proclaiming to them his desire. This is what he wants to do. I want to be merciful. I want to forgive sin and transgression and iniquity. And David, he was able to see this about God too. He was very sensitive. And he wrote this in the Psalms that the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endureth unto all generations. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, nature of our God, and it's able to be seen abundantly now underneath the covenant that we are. In Christ, we see the paramount exhibition of His mercy and of His goodness. Uh, in his epistle to the Ephesians, the Apostle Paul, he declared to us that this is what awaits us in our future. Those who are in Christ, that in the ages to come, the Lord will show them the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards them in Christ Jesus. This is like a, a focus in redemption. However, uh, the goodness of God isn't just pleasantness. It's not just, you know, Him being pleasant. It's, it's tied up in His righteousness. Uh, abundant in goodness and in truth, which is holy. Uh, it's, it, it's what is truly good. It's what is really worthy of virtue. And this can only really be said about God. Only God is really good in this sense. Uh, the, the Savior Himself, when He was on the earth, He, he said this so to those who called Him good master, you know. He said, why callest thou me good? There's none good but God. Now understand, He wasn't telling them, I'm not good. That's not what He was saying. He said, you see me as an earthly teacher, as one who's just wise, and so you call me good master. He's wanting to point their thoughts in the right direction and tell them, there's none good but God. That's right, that's right. So in our text, again, we're witnessing this sensitivity of Paul to, to the will of God in his prayers. That he, he prays for them that God would fulfill his own good pleasure. That he would be satisfied. And that he would be able to fill all that he's desired to do in them. And you notice the, the focus of this. Is according to his eternal purpose in Christ Jesus. That, that this exhibition of his goodness and his desire to, to, bre to, to bless them. And for his nature to be revealed and expressed in them. And the working out of it. That this would be fulfilled in them. The thing that God designed to do. What he wants to do. That this would be fulfilled in us. And if, if you can see it rightly, this is really the most fruitful and the most profitable thing that you could ask for. Yeah. If this is God's agenda, you know, salvation is, is God's prerogative, so to speak. He, he's the one who initiated the plan. He's the one who is bringing this plan to fruition. The one who began a good work in you, He will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, this, this is God's salvation. And on an individual level, uh, only God really knows what would be most profitable, uh, how this would be most profitably worked out in you. So, so what, what more could you possibly ask for? Uh, so I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor either even entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that loved Him. You, you, you couldn't even think of anything this high. Uh, if this is true, then does it not behoove us to ask the Lord's will be done in all things? Uh, think of how glorious this is, brethren, that we have a God who is good. We have a God who is abundant in mercy and in truth and in loving kindness. And it is His good pleasure to ensure that all of these things are granted in abundance to those who are in Christ Jesus. That just sounds like a good deal to me. Now, with this in mind, how, how ridiculous does this sound for a person to act with their own self-interest in mind? Uh, from the, the flesh's point of view, this seems like the thing that you need to do. You know, everyone, you got to look out for number one, you know. If no one's going to look out for you if you don't look out for you, you know. And we're talking about a God who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. So even, even people in the flesh who are thinking about their own dreams and their own desires, they can't even think of anything that's this high. They can't even desire anything that this, that's, that is this high. N nothing that is, is great and profound and satisfying as what the Lord has provided for those in Christ Jesus. So true satisfaction, true the fulfillment for the purpose for which they were created. This is why you were made. 
So how could you find salvation in any other thing than fulfilling the purpose for which the God who made you created you? Amen. Amen. That He would fulfill all the good pleasure of His goodness and the work of faith with power. Yes. There is power in this work of faith. Now we notice that the Apostle says that God would fulfill this. He refers to faith as, this, as a work. This is a project, so to speak. This is something that God is running, and he's, he's driving it. And by inference, this is something that God initiated. This is the, the way that the Scripture refers to faith in several instances. Amen. And this is, We're not speaking about the object of your faith, but the source of your faith. In Romans 3, he says, the faith of God... And in Galatians 2, the faith of Jesus Christ and the faith of the Son of God or the, the faith of Christ. That is, this is the faith that comes from God, that comes from Christ. And, and Jude talked about it this way, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful me, for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto all the saints. We know that it is given unto us to believe. That, th that there was a time when faith came. Uh, faith is not merely being strongly persuaded of something. Although faith surely does involve being fully persuaded. It, it's, it's more than that. Uh, believing in Christ is not on the same level as others say, well, everyone has faith in something, you know. Uh, everyone believes something because it, we know the scripture says that all men not not all men have faith you know well, we did not always have faith and we just chose at a certain point in time to put our faith in Christ that's not the way that, that the scripture talks about faith not in this sense not the faith of Christ this is a divine entity that, that is in its nature granted to us by God it's something that has power that any man's conviction or belief can't grant unto you Amen. and this is something that comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God and this is not by any word. This is by the, the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is by the gospel of Jesus Christ. By believing the record that God has given to us concerning the death of Christ and the fact that God was satisfied in that death. When we believe that, that God is, was satisfied in that, that that payment was the payment in full for the debt of the sin of humanity. You know, it wasn't really a decision on our part to initiate the faith. Uh, we had to make a decision. I, I know the, there's, a, there's an overemphasis on the decision nowadays. You know, you have to make a decision. You have to decide to follow Christ. And that's true. We make a decision. But faith precedes the decision. We make the decision by faith. Uh, there's, there's a lot of, of, of work going on under the ground before the, the, the root of that springs up and something happens. And you, you're able to, to make that decision in faith. And saying that, however, the point isn't that God does everything for us. We understand that, that we had no part in the foundation of our faith, but we know that Jesus is said to be the author of our faith, but this doesn't mean we don't play a vital role in the keeping of our faith. And so we are to work out our own salvation. You know, this, this language of spiritual upkeep is something that we find all throughout the epistles. Uh, we're exhorted to keep the faith. They were exhorted to stand fast in the faith. To stand fast in one spirit with one mind and striving together for the faith of the gospel. This, this language of, of keeping and holding and, and not letting go of the things that the Lord has given unto us. To keep this up and grow in it. And just as we read in, in Jude, to earnestly contend for the faith. Because there is an opposer. There is someone who is trying to, to make shipwreck of our faith, so to speak. So faith is a working entity. It's, it's not possessed as a token. It's, it's, it is to be used. And Hebrews 11 is, is a testimony of that. That all those in generations past who had faith, they did something with them. It, it didn't work something in them independent from their involvement. You, you notice it doesn't say that uh, faith made Noah build the ark. You know, It doesn't say it that way. It said, by faith, Noah built the ark. You know, it's... Amen. It's something that you did by faith. Amen. And this is a work of faith with power. 
There is some real power behind this. Uh, God has granted the faith and He is underwriting the faith. See, Jesus is the author and He is the finisher of our faith. It, it is by God through Christ that we're being brought along. See, we're being led to glory. We're, we're not just given signposts along the way and pointed in the direction. We're, we're, we're holding Jesus' hand, so to speak, and He's leading us. He's bringing many sons to glory. See, our faith is it's really the prime motivating factor behind all the decisions that we, may, that we make in our life. All things have to be done by faith. So whatsoever is not of faith is sin. This is, this is like the, the, the law of things underneath the new covenant, so to speak. That, that everything must be ordered in, in light of the divine agenda and salvation. Uh, by faith, we're able to overcome the temptation of the wicked one. But the reason why we're able to do this is because there are greater and more satisfying things that we can obtain that make the temptation seem uh, we don't even want it. And why is that? Because there's power. That's why. Amen. I noticed as we're going through this that uh, um, when we're speaking of our involvement of the faith, he exhorts us to work our own salvation, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But but when he talks about God, it's the work of faith with power. So that as it's demonstrated in the miracles when Christ did when he walked among us in the world, the man who picked up his bed and walked. As soon as he, he, he took the effort to pick up his bed, that's when the power was given unto him to do that. The man who stretched forth his hand with the withered hand, as soon as he made that effort to stretch forth his hand, that's when he got the healing. It's, it's, it's the same way. Amen. At the point in which we extend ourselves in the participation of it, that's when the power is granted unto us. Amen. See, there's, there's power to say no to ungodliness and worldly not lust because uh, there's, there's things so much better that we've taken a hold of. They, they, they make them look, look weak and beggarly. So we can actually live our lives circumspectly with the world to come in mind because there's, there's spiritual vision to see things that are unseen. We're, we're, we're able to see the hope that is ahead of us. We're actually able to see the things in the world to come that you can't see by, by your mortal eyes. That's power. That's what that is. There's, that's the work of faith with power. So we can, we can actually order all the things in our lives to be pleasing unto God because we can reason on this, that He's begun a good in work, He's that's begun a good work in you, He will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ with power. Amen. So then, all of these things that come together, this is the convergence at the at the to the conclusion of this, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in Him. Now this is, in, in, in summary, this is the calling, that the name of Jesus Christ might be glorified in you. Amen. So when you're seen by the principalities and powers that are looking on, when they see you, they're actually going to be able to say, I see Christ in Him. So the, the divine nature that you've been become partakers of in Christ Jesus as you work out your own salvation, that's actually revealing aspects of God's personality in you that they couldn't have been shown outside of this realm of, of um, opposition and, and uh, conflict that has happened in this world. Uh, th this, all this thing is going to end in the culmination of uh, this race of glorified men in aggregate that are actually a perfect representation of Christ. They're a perfect mirror of Christ. When they see them, there will be nothing in them that we can, they can say, well, that's not like Christ. When they, when they see that, the bride of Christ, the Lamb, when they see the heavenly Jerusalem as a, the habitation of God and the Spirit, there, there, will be no, there will be no conflict then. Amen. This is the way he says it in Romans 8.17, 8, uh, talking about our part in this. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we also may be glorified together. Now, this is something that we look forward to, brethren, that not only are, not only are we glorifying the Lord in, in the present, but that the glory, most of the glory is lying up ahead. The culmination of the glory is going to be at the end of the world. That's when most of the glory is going to be shown. And that we actually have a part in that glory. Now, that is a glorious thought to me. Amen. That 
that we are actually going to have a part in that. That we have a, we're, we're, it said that we're going to judge, help judge angels. We're going to help judge the world with the Lord. We're going to reign with Christ. We're going to be a pillar in the house of our God. That's something to think about. It says, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with Him in glory. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory. So in the meantime, you, you humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time. See, uh, we're not perpetually going to be last. We're not always going to be abased as we are in this life. <laughs> the, the work of denying ourselves is going to come to an end. As believers, we're not, we don't enjoy pain. We don't enjoy suffering. It, the, the, the people who are without, the unbelievers kind of think we're a little bit nutty. You're a little bit weird. You know, you're submitting yourself to, to, to being a base and to, be, to suffer for Christ. And they don't, they don't see the end of this. They don't realize what we're looking forward to. That on that day, the, the last shall be first. We're going to be first then. Now this, all of this that has come together, this is the fulfillment of God's good pleasure and salvation. Brethren, I... I, I I want to pro pro proclaim again to you this morning that it is God's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. <laughs> yeah, God will not share His glory with another, but on that day we will not be another. Yes, yeah. See, the bride is not the 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 bride of Christ is not another. Yeah. So as we as we continue our day today, uh, our thoughts to be ordered in this direction that we would have we would be able to to be counted worthy of this calling. That, that, that we would be more sensitive to the will of the Lord in our lives, that, he, that we would be able to uh, have the work of faith with power worked out in us. Thank you, brother. Amen. Amen.